I would like to hear more about the story about what inspired you to start the Center for American Liberty. Well, I've been practicing law for about 30 years now. And in that first decade of practicing at big firms, I got the opportunity to help individuals um, through my pro bono work, not just the corporations that the big law firms represent. And I really found that work rewarding, helping individuals. But what I learned is that if I wanted to help individuals who had uh, civil liberties issues from a more conservative perspective, religious liberty and speech issues, um, we were not allowed to do that at big law mm. firms, which are dominated by liberals. And so when you get out there into the world today, you find that a lot of the litigation that's being pushed by the left is done through the guise of nonprofits. And there are almost no nonprofits on the right that have a secular um, perspective on these issues. There's a handful of Christian nonprofits and they focus on important Christian civil liberties issues. But the whole rest of the world, including election integrity issues, speech issues, the rights of reporters, um, and of course, uh, you know, the rights of people of other religions are, are not really addressed by these groups. And so I wanted to start this nonprofit to help tap uh, the needs of all these people. And basically the premise is pretty simple. You know, lawyers usually go into the law thinking that they're going to do some good, and then they get out there and they realize that there's not a lot of good going on there in uh, private practice, you know, other than for corporate clients who, of course, have important needs. And people want to give back. And so what we do at the Center for American Liberty is enable lawyers who aren't in a public interest law firm to give a portion of their time at a reduced rate to help uh, causes that they care about. And so this allows lawyers at smaller firms um, who can't afford to do things for free to be able to get grants from our nonprofit and help uh, vindicate important civil rights. And I'm really proud that we've opened up public interest litigation to a whole new cadre of attorneys who want to do good with their careers. Um, you know, not everybody can be selected for the Department of Justice like your husband and do important work there. And so this really, really democratizes uh, giving back that way. I love that story. So Nikki and I met in law school, Harvard Law School, and our first class, first day, we had a um, seasoned professor, shall we say, who went on an hour and a half long dialogue about, or monologue, about how um, Harvard produced the walking wounded. He said, all of you have come in here as the best students in the nation with great dreams about how you're going to help people. And the whole design and program of this school is to tear down your sense of self and then build you back up in the image of the law school so that you will take the high dollar offers from big law firms, just like the ones you're talking about, Harmeet, and they'll pay you these huge corporate salaries and you'll never do a lick of good in your life, but you will give a lot of money back to the law school. And don't do it, don't fall for it. Um, it's all documented psychology you can read about in journals and law reviews. And instead of doing great things, you'll go do corporate law things. Um, I listened to it and I thought, well, I'm just a kid from Alaska and you know, bad grades still get degrees. I, Cause you said, you know, we're gonna give you all these bad grades so that you lose your sense of identity. Um, and first semester I worked really, really hard and I got all the grades he said we'd get. And I was like, oh, it's just the indoctrination process like he said. And I graduated from Harvard Law, just like every other Harvard Law grad. And I went off and did great things. I didn't become a corporate lawyer. But that's what I hear you saying too, is that um, you decided to go off and do great things and you're finding other lawyers. Um, where did that motivation, you could have had a super cozy life, right? You went to a great law school. Um, we all know the law school you went to. You could have gone to uh, and been one of these McMansion lawyers that we all of our friends became. Um, why didn't you? What inspired well, I, you? I mean, I am idealistic, and you know, I come from a family of physicians, and so and, and a few of my relatives are also in the military in India, and so you know, they kind of have ideals, and they went into um, vocations to help people. Um, I broke away from that family tradition, but I still wanted to help people through my career. And, you know, I, I found that there were really limited opportunities to do that in big law. And in my later career, I fought up against big law firms who represent Planned Parenthood for free, who represent um, uh. National Abortion Federation, who uh, right now I'm up against the, you know, one of the most elite law firms in America representing uh, the Hastings Law School, which we're suing for, right. you know, woke changing of the name. They're 
they they just lost with their top partner. They just lost a motion with uh, two lawyers from that law school under 10 years uh, of practice. So, you know, it, it is a great equalizer in theory that anybody can go into court with a good training. And, um, it, you know, a judge is supposed to hear both sides evenly. In reality, we've seen if you're um, very famous, that may not be the case, but uh, it, it still is an opportunity mm -hmm. to vindicate important rights where the government might ignore them or, um, you know, legislators don't care about them. Mm. Hermie, you've, you've talked a little bit about sort of that, that passion for civil rights and given us a really good overview of what the Center for American Liberty does. Could you talk maybe a little bit about one or two of the cases that are, have been most personally significant to you in terms of some of the victories that, uh, that you all have won? Sure. Well, our, our nonprofit is only about four years old, going into our fifth year now. And um, I started it after a number of times when I, as a head of my own law firm in San Francisco, was asked to step in and help an important cause. And there's usually no funding attached to that request. And so I did finance the many cases. And, you know, I, I finally found that there were donors who were interested in helping with these cases and causes, but they only wanted to give to a nonprofit. And so you know, when we laid the table and started the nonprofit, that was the premise. And I'd been doing a lot of work in the free speech area and involving college campuses. And so we started thinking that was the kind of work that we were going to do. And uh, Mark Trammell from the Young Americas Foundation, their acting general counsel, he joined me. So there were really just two of us in this nonprofit to start with. Um, our first case that we handled was the case of journalist Andy No, who was viciously attacked by Antifa in Portland. And, um, you know, thank God he survived, but he was in the hospital for uh, traumatic brain injuries for being assaulted for the crime of reporting there against these thugs. And the local police did nothing about it. Andy is very idealistic and he wanted to hold these people accountable. Um, we lawyers know that, you know, one of the first things you do in private practice is figure out, is the person I'm suing, do they have any money in case I win? Can they pay me? And, um, you know, that's the usual analysis. And then suing a, basically a terrorist organization of Antifa is obviously challenging because they're amorphous. They hide behind masks. They, you know, are societies sort of dispossessed. They don't have assets to sue over for the most part. Um, but Andy wanted to pursue it to make a point, wanted to get discovery because clearly someone was funding Antifa, providing them with material and weapons and uh, masks and all of that stuff. And so we engaged in a four years of litigation, um, ultimately, you know, having a trial where disappointingly, two of these Antifa thugs who, you know, stayed in through the end, they were, um, they were acquitted by a Portland jury. But uh, we did settle one of these claims. And then importantly, the same judge who presided over the trial granted default judgments in the amount of $300,000 against wow. three Antifa people who were not there. So even though a jury acquitted two of these people on the evidence, the judge, who is more objective, saw that the evidence had clearly established that we had video evidence showing that these people had assaulted Andy. And so now collecting on that as a challenge, only a nonprofit could have vindicated the principle that an American journalist should not be attacked by a bunch of thugs who put Antifa on trial, probably deterred them from some of their behavior, and showed that you can get uh, judgments um, and also hold people accountable if they have insurance policies in the case of the one who settled. So I'm really proud of that case. But the other category of cases I would say that were successful, um, relatively speaking, is, is the COVID litigation. So we started Center for American Liberty in 2019 when nobody had heard of COVID and took Andy's case. And then COVID hit, everything got locked down. And we were the first and the most frequent lawyers in America at the Center for American Liberty to sue governors for violating our civil rights using unconstitutional and overly expansive executive orders. Um, many of these cases were filed in California, uh, got various clients versus Gavin Newsom. Ultimately, courts really shut the courthouse doors to us, except for in one area, which is religious liberties. And so we're proud to have won three cases at the United States Supreme Court, where, um, where the court summarily ordered uh, the state of California to stop interfering with Americans' rights to worship together, be it Bible study or evangelical prayer. And we're really proud of those cases. And the third of those cases, Tandon versus Newsom, is being cited um, you know, regularly throughout the uh, First Amendment bar as, as we speak 
as a landmark case on religious liberties because it really elevated what Justice Scalia, ironically, had really relegated um, religious liberties to a sort of a second class status in the bundle of rights in the First Amendment jurisprudence. And I think this ruling of this case that we brought went some way to correcting that balance and really elevating First Amendment religious liberties rights as clearly part of the important bundle of rights.